So thank you for joining us tonight for this TikTok. Um, some of you are probably new to Seeds to Plate or new to me. And so I wanna welcome you to um, my website and to my company. I am a garden coach as well as a speaker and I also sell products on my website and I really enjoy gardening and I've been doing it for about 30 plus years. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to green school with UMass this fall. And one of the classes that we took as part of that green school was a class on ticks and Larry was the presenter. And I was so impressed with his presentation and so overwhelmed by the, the um, information that I got from his presentation and found that it was very helpful for me uh, because as I mentioned earlier, I have been bitten and I did get Lyme. Unfortunately, I did get treated, but you know, this is an ongoing problem here in New England. It's a, a big problem for gardeners and everyone who likes to spend lots of time outside. And I think it's really important to share the information about how to protect yourself. And I'm doing it in February because most people don't think that ticks are around in February. And Larry's gonna give us some really interesting information about ticks in cold weather and how they survive in cold weather. And so you'll realize that it's not safe any time of the year. You can still get bitten in February. So since we're all inside, not outside gardening as much, I thought we'd have time to watch a presentation and hopefully uh, learn some, some good information about ticks. So with that, I'm going to introduce Larry. Larry Dapsis is an entomologist and he claims to have been an entomologist since he was five years old. He has, a BS, <laughs> he has a BS in environmental science and biology from Fitchburg State University and an MS entomology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He has 36 years of professional pest management experience including vegetables, cranberries and household insects. He joined the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension in 2011 as a deer tick project coordinator and entomologist and is a member of the Barnstable County Task Force on Lyme and other tick-borne diseases. So he knows his ticks. And like I said, I've seen his presentation before and he does an excellent job of explaining everything. So I am going to turn it over to him. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um... I can't think of a better way to spend a, a quiet, nice evening like this than by having a very robust discussion of infectious disease, okay? It certainly works for me. Um, I've been with uh, Cape Cod Cooperative Extension now uh, 10 years. Uh, prior to this, um, I spent most of my career in agriculture uh, most of that with ocean spray cranberries, where I was the, the bug guy initially for North America, believe it or not. And at some point, my career made a very hard left turn from agriculture into public health. And that's when my eyes got open quite widely. Uh, I had heard of Lyme disease, but I honestly didn't know a bloody thing about it. Uh, I don't even remember ever seeing a deer tick. And I knew some of my growers um, had Lyme disease, but um, I didn't know how much it had impacted their families. And now I'm seeing it probably impacted some of the families in a big, big way. So when I started probing around and, and trying to assimilate myself into this uh, area, um, I want to share with you my very, very first observation in this uh, arena. Everyone hates ticks, okay? Um, this, this is what we call in corporate ease, we have, we have alignment around a, a singular problem, and that's a good thing. And, and uh, and it's not just a casual hatred of ticks. This, this hatred's guttural. You say the word tick to a person and, and they grimace and they might be reminded of a time when they were trying to remove a tick and it, it just wouldn't budge uh, or if they got un, unfortunately gotten sick. And, and so these are things that uh, people just don't tolerate. Uh, they think, you know, think, you know 
This is, this is, God did not do something good for us. And when I say everyone hates ticks, I mean everyone hates ticks. So when a gentle soul like the Dalai Lama turns his back on a form of life on this planet, that's a headline. That's an absolute headline. All right, Lyme is not something that popped up in Lyme, Connecticut 45 years ago and started spreading out. Uh, in fact, it's not a new disease. It's a re-emerging disease. Lyme is endemic in about 65 countries around the world. So certainly North America, parts of South America, it's a big deal um, and up and coming big deal in, in, in Europe and even in Southeast Asia. So it's kind of everywhere. And, and so it's getting a lot of attention, not as much attention as it needs to be, quite frankly. The evidence shows that this Lyme bacteria has been on this planet for anywhere from 50 to 100,000 years. So it's, it's been out there for a long time. And we've done a lot of things to really promote its rebound. All right, if you ever thought you were living at ground zero, um, you are, okay? Uh, Lyme has been found in 49 out of 50 states. It just, it has not yet been found in Hawaii. But if you look at all six New England states, yeah, the top six positions in the country. Uh, so, so we are under siege as a region. Now let's look at the different players we have. Um, f there's a few baby boomers in this audience. And for us baby boomers, tick identification was easy, okay? When we were growing up, uh, this was the only tick we had, the good old American dog tick. Um, I, I grew up in the Worcester area. And if we had deer ticks and Lyme disease and the way I spent my youth, I was always in the woods or out in the swamps in the meadows. Um, I probably would have gotten Lyme disease about 50 times and we'd be having this discussion through a Ouija board, okay? Um, I consider this creature more of an annoyance than a real public health threat. It can vector the pathogens that cause Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia, very serious diseases. But this far north, um, those are, are quite rare. Uh, on the Cape, we did six years ago have one case of Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but, but it's um, quite uncommon. Um, I'm showing you a, a picture of what I think your future looks like. This is the Lone Star Tick. And it's not named the Lone Star Tick because it comes from Texas. Uh, the adult female has this bright white spot on her back. And, and this is something that um, we now have firmly uh, established on, on Cape Cod. And, and uh, is it here in Worcester County? Um, don't know. Uh, nobody outside of southeastern Massachusetts is doing any sort of surveillance for these things. So maybe it's here, maybe it's not. Um, in talking with uh, Dr. Katie Brown, she's the epidemiologist and state veterinarian at the Department of Public Health. She told me that veterinarians across the state are reporting finding Lone Star ticks on animals. So it, it's being introduced and, and um, at some point it's going to take hold. Um, this thing has been moving north uh, for some time. A number of ecologists, uh, myself included, uh, think this is a function of climate change. The earth is getting warmer and we're seeing plants and animals in places we never used to see them before. Okay, you know, the fake news stuff. And up until Oh, 10 years ago, the northernmost established points um, in Massachusetts were on Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Well, um, about a year after I was hired, uh, I was called out to Sandy Neck Beach Park, and we found a very well-established population out there in West Barnstable. And we've also found well-established populations in East Falmouth, and, and now it's uh, being found in, in other parts of the Cape. Uh, so it's here. 
This is a very different tick than we're accustomed to. Um, it's aggressive. Uh, these creatures have very good vision and they can run. They can run with the speed of a spider. If these things see you from like 20 feet away, they're gonna come rolling at you like a little race car. Now, the adult female, uh, like other ticks, she lays her eggs in the spring in a mass. And that egg mass might be four or 5,000 eggs. And those hatch out uh, in the month of August. And they hatch into these tiny, tiny larvae that are less than a millimeter um, long. And so you end up with these very high densities um, of, of tick larvae. Um, and so if you're walking along and you bump into one, generally you're gonna meet most of the family in a hurry. And so within minutes with this aggressive behavior, you can get two or 300 bites and those things will burn and itch for four to six weeks, even with being treated with something like cortisone. Now, while they don't vector the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, but they've got their own unique diseases associated with it. So ehrlichiosis and tularemia, yeah, those are pretty serious things. Um, to date, we have not found those pathogens in the Lone Star tick populations uh, in our area. Um, the middle one, starry, it's a type of rash disease with flu-like symptoms pretty easy to treat and cure. And we have found that pathogen in the tick populations and Cape Cod Hospital has treated people for Starry. But the real game changer with this tick is the bite of a Lone Star tick can trigger an allergy to red meat consumption. And that allergic response can be as mild as hives and go all the way to anaphylactic shock it's a scary situation. And we have had that situation on Cape Cod. And it's not just beef, but it's uh, other red meats, pork and lamb. And be mindful of byproducts like beef derived gelatin. And if you think about processed foods, beef derived gelatin is in a lot of different things, including those marshmallows we feed our kids on at 4th of July picnics. So if you get this red meat allergy, it, it, no, it needs a lot of research. Nobody really has a, a real handle on how, how this happens and how long it might uh, be in you. There's some circumstantial evidence that a pathogen might be involved. So it, it suggests that you can have a chronic systemic infection of, of some sort, but a lot more research needs to be done. Um, this is still the, the front and center tick uh, for us. We all call it the deer tick, but the more accurate name for this tick is the black-legged tick. And we'll get into the reasons for that in a, in a couple minutes. Um, deer ticks, they are not like Lone Star ticks. They don't chase you. In fact, deer ticks are blind. So they're uh, what we call an ambush predator. They have to wait for dinner to come to them. And so they have this particular behavior called questing. And so here's an adult female deer tick on top of that twig. And she's got her front leg stretched up like she's signaling a New England Patriots touchdown. And hopefully at some point next season, we'll see a lot more of them than we saw this past season. Um, but uh, what she's doing is, is sampling her environment. Um, she uh, has a great sense of smell and her nose is on her front legs. And so one of the chemicals she can smell is carbon dioxide. So if you're walking through an area, maybe with your pooch and you're both breathing, um, you're changing the concentration of carbon dioxide around you and they can detect that. They can detect changes in temperature like body heat. So the closer you get, it knows something's going on and they can detect vibration. So while they can't see you, they've got all this information coming toward it. And what they'll do is orient towards that 
and wave those front legs and hope you get close enough to touch it. Because at the end of those legs, they have this beautiful little claw and all you have to do is touch it. It's going to attach and start looking around for a place to start feeding. All right, so here's a deer tick. Let's look at the hardware. Here's a deer tick head under a microscope. Those things on either side of the tick's head, those are called palps. <clears throat> That's what the tick uses to taste you and see if you taste interesting enough to become dinner because ticks are somewhat selective. Some, some people are tick magnets and others not so much, uh, kind of like mosquitoes. If you are so chosen, it takes these things, uh, these are called chelicerae, and these are like scalpel blades with hooks. And what that tick does, and this whole process takes just about one minute, um, there's some really cool YouTube videos online to you can see this process. So what the tick does, it makes an incision, hooks in and pulls. And it does this over and over. It's kind of like doing the breaststroke. And with each tug, it's driving that beak of the mouth part down deeper and deeper into your skin. And if we look at that under a microscope, yeah, pretty impressive. So it's fairly long with respect to body size, but it's got those nice recurved barbs like little fish hooks. So if you were ever removing a tick and felt like you were ripping out your flesh, it's because you are, okay? And uh, ticks don't start sucking blood immediately. Uh, it, 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 it's a process of setting up a, a feeding lesion, which takes about 24 hours. So the first thing a tick bite uh, does is it injects you with tick spit, okay? They've got no manners at all. <clears throat> and tick spit to a science geek like me is absolutely fascinating. It's got a lot of very interesting chemicals. And one of the chemicals in tick spit is glue. Those things actually cement themselves in place. So between the barbs and the cement, yeah, they're hard to dislodge. You just can't flick them off you. Um, it'll secrete anticoagulants and keep your blood from clotting. Uh, phasodilators, that'll increase the flow of blood to the point of attachment and it will anesthetize you. That thing does not want to be detected. It just wants to quietly go along its way feeding. And uh, from start to finish, a tick might be feeding uh, until it's fully engorged and that might take five days or so. And uh, so what the tick does, it goes through cycles of sucking blood and spitting and sucking blood and more spitting. And when it's finally done, it secretes an enzyme, dissolves that glue and, and then backs itself out and may have left you with a few microbial presents. All right, why the name deer tick is a misnomer. This thing has been documented to be associated with 125 different vertebrate hosts. So it's not just about deer, it's not just about mice, it's a complex ecosystem. There's a lot of moving parts here. Now the rodents, they are absolutely key in this whole ecosystem. Uh, they're, they're what we call competent host reservoirs. And what we mean by host competency is that rodents like mice and chipmunks and rats, they have the ability to harbor that Lyme disease bacteria and transmit it back into the tick population. So it's kind of like microbial ping pong. Um, birds play a role a couple different ways. Uh, birds are great at moving ticks around. That's how we think Lone Star got introduced to Cape Cod. Uh, Sandy Neck Beach Park is a perfect flyway for migrating birds. So it's easy to think about birds stopping off on Nantucket or the vineyard, picking up some lone stars, stopping off in Sandy Neck, boom, off we go. But there are some birds that are competent reservoir hosts for the Lyme bacteria. Uh, songbirds, like our American robin, and our good old friend, the wild turkey. 
And then we have a lot of incompetent hosts. So creatures like deer and raccoons and coyotes, uh, they're dead end hosts. They, they cannot infect a tick. But what they can do is supply a blood meal and keep that tick population rolling along. All right, the risk of infection is year round and we'll look at some data in a minute to support that. Um, but the greatest risk isn't where you might think it is based on the data. It's not with these adult stage ticks. The, this stage, they start emerging in September and uh, then they're with us until April into May. And in our surveillance research, we find 50% of them are packing that Lyme disease bacteria. So better odds in our state lottery. But that's a larger stage of the tick, more easily to detect it. The biggest risk is from the SNP stage tick. And they start coming out in mid-May and they're with us into August, into maybe even early September. And, and what we find is about 20% of them are infected. But that's a smaller stage of the tick and more likely to elude a tick check. So as we were thinking about this, how do we convey this to the general public uh, to help people develop a search image? How big is a big tick? How little is a little tick? Well, as it turns out bagel toppings work perfectly in this regard. Um, an adult stage deer tick, they're the size of a sesame seed. And even with my um, declining vision, <laughs> that's something even I can see. But those nymph stage ticks, yeah, they're the size of a poppy seed. So something that small with eight legs, a really bad attitude that can plant you on your butt for a very, very long time or even worse. So we see this in the case data. So yeah, as Judith was saying, uh, yeah, it's a threat year round. So yeah, we see cases of Lyme disease in January, February, March, October, November, and December. But during the summer months when that nymph stage tick is active, that stage of the tick is responsible for 85% of all tick-borne illnesses, okay? So we have to be vigilant year round but during those summer months, we really have to be on top of our game. And not everybody's impacted equally. This is Lyme disease by age group, okay? So on the far left, kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme in the state. So my message to the soccer moms and soccer dads is that this shows that everything you've been doing up to this point in time clearly is not working we have to reassess the game plan. And I'm gonna make recommendations that you might not be comfortable with, but it's gonna be way more effective, effective than what you've been doing. And then the incidence rate is lower for people in their 20 somethings and 30 somethings. People are starting careers, they're starting families. There's not as much outdoor activity time, but as we get older, there's a couple things happening. Uh, yeah, at some point we, we have more leisure time. So uh, gardening, so ticks and gardening, perfect marriage, uh, golf. And, and our immune system is starting to play the back nine. So we see this other peak of the incidence rate where people, you know, 60 plus, um, so that we have this bimodal distribution. And so if we look at the state overall, uh, this is tick diseases overall. So um, Dukes County, the, the vineyard in Nantucket, the incidence rates there are higher than any other place in the visible universe. And there's some reasons for that. They're, they're not doing the things I would like to see them doing. Um, so on Cape Cod, we have very high incidence rate, Barnstable County, but with our outreach program that we've been running for my 10 years and my predecessor before me, the county's made a big investment. We're the only county in the state where the incidence rate of Lyme disease is not increasing. So public education, uh, we know is effective. Uh, so Plymouth County is actually um, higher incidence rate than us. And then you look out in Western Mass, Berkshire and Hampshire County, 
uh, Berkshire County, they are being overrun with anaplasmosis and they are screaming for help. They just don't know what to do. So Worcester County and Middlesex and Norfolk, you're kind of in the middle of this. So it doesn't mean it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a non-issue. It just means it's, it's less of an issue than uh, the Western or Eastern part of the state, but it's significant, okay? Um, and it's on the increase, all right? The trend lines are very clear. All right, and we have other emerging diseases. So uh, up top, babesiosis, that's kind of like getting malaria. Uh, it can be outright fatal. It's very serious. Um, the bottom one, that's um, uh, anaplasmosis and also equally serious. And we see different impact in terms of the age distribution. Uh, these two diseases are very uncommon in younger people. There are some cases, but 90% of the cases of these two diseases are in people age 60 and older. And, and on Cape Cod, uh, we have a, a fairly old demographic. We have, a, uh, I've got a lot of highly susceptible clients out there. So programs I run at uh, Council on Aging Centers and Libraries are, and cable television programming are all very important for that group. Um, it was brought to my attention by Katie Brown at DPH that in that three-year period, we had 14 cases of a fairly rare disease, Powassan virus. Um, and in the clinical presentation is typically encephalitis, swelling of the brain. Uh, so you're in the hospital, okay? And it's fatal in about 10% of the cases. And so of those three fatalities, uh, two of those occurred on Cape Cod. So it's not something you can treat. Uh, they can only provide supportive care. So we decided to do surveillance on Cape Cod looking for this virus. And, and we thought we were looking for a needle in a haystack. But to our astonishment, um, we found Powassan infected ticks at four out of these six sites from Falmouth in the far left, all the way out to Truro in the upper right. And infection rates as high as 10%. And, and I'm sure this virus is present, you know, throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and, and so we see a fairly high exposure risk and very low uh, number of cases. So we kind of look at this through the lens of West Nile virus. We know West Nile, a lot of people can be exposed to West Nile virus and, and not get sick. And so with Powassan, uh, when it decides to go neuroinvasive, that's when things go sideways with people. Um, but I'm sure if we tested a lot of blood on the Cape, we'd see a lot of people showing antibodies to this virus. Winters, and I get this question all the time from the media and people uh, in general assume that when you get some, a real cold snap, um, it's got to do something to the tick population. Uh, people know that when you get your first hard frost, mosquito season's done, all right? And, and people kind of project that onto ticks. Um, it's been bitter cold, Larry. It's got to do something. So it, there's a lot of wishful thinking out there. Well, are Massachusetts winters all that harsh? Um, I don't think so overall, we get cold snaps. Um, but I will tell you, when I worked for Ocean Spray Cranberries, I spent 24 years traveling to Wisconsin, where I was known by the name Sven. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's me back in the day. And in Wisconsin, uh, winters 25 below zero is not uncommon. And in Wisconsin, ticks are very healthy and Wisconsin's quite endemic for Lyme disease. And I think it explains why Wisconsin has the highest per capita consumption of brandy in the country. These people are absolute warriors. <laughs> they, they know how to protect themselves. Uh, they're a great group of people, I love them. The reason for this is that ticks make a chemical uh, called glycerol. 
well, what the heck is glycerol? These things make antifreeze, all right? That's pretty clever. And the way this works is that glycerol prevents ice crystal formation in cells. So if you get an ice crystal that forms in a cell, it's gonna puncture the cell wall. What, what's inside the cell is gonna leak out and that's not good for the organism, plant or animal. And they made a side discovery that this bacteria feeds on the glycerol as its principal source of food, okay? So this is one perfectly engineered little package. That's the beauty of evolutionary biology. All right, so one of the questions I get is, Larry, when, when we were kids as baby boomers, we didn't have this problem. Um, how did this get to be the scope of the problem it is now. And so this is a picture of me thinking about the problem, okay? What's what's happened to, to uh, lead us into this uh, situation? Um, well, one, one things we look at is we've had an abundance of deer. Uh, deer have expanded their range and increased populations. And if you look at those deer ears, all those red blots, those are fully engorged deer ticks. And so each one of those ticks is probably worth, you know, 3000 eggs. So it, it um, has a, a huge population potential as a result of feeding on deer. But um, there are people that want to blame Bambi, Bambi and, and, and shoot the deer. Let's get rid of the deer. And uh, the people on the islands of Nantucket and the Vineyard, they're convinced they, they're getting some academic coaching, not moi, that, that killing the deer is your salvation. And, and, and that's really nothing can be further from the truth. I've got a colleague in New York, Rick Osfeld at the Cary Institute of Ecological Studies. And he shared with me some really interesting data um, he had a 14 year study where he looked at the density of deer in the fall, which is that horizontal axis on the bottom. And then he looked at the density of deer tick nymphs, uh, the vertical axis, two years later. There's, there's a lag time in, in the life cycle. So if, if deer density, if you, the more deer you have, the higher the tick population, those data points should line up in a straight line from the lower left to the upper right, but they don't, okay? And if you look at that statistic in the upper right, R squared, 0 0.007. There is absolutely zero correlation of the population of deer and the population of ticks. So I tell people, if you're focused on the deer, you focused on the wrong thing. All right, what else has been happening? And, and this is Cape Cod, but, but this is exactly what's been happening in Worcester County and throughout, throughout the Commonwealth. We've been cutting down a lot of trees, okay? If you look at total forested acreage, yeah, we've, we've um, cut down a lot of trees, making room for you know, suburban housing expansion. And so, yeah, we see these suburban neighborhoods. And, and so we didn't just cut down trees, we actually fragmented the forest into small patches. And when you fragment something like that and get into a smaller and smaller size patch, at some point you start losing biological diversity and that has a profound effect on the system. So you start losing your top tier predators like fox Fox are the most efficient predator we have for things like chipmunks and white-footed mice. And what we've done is create a situation where we've just given the whole landscape to these infective reservoir hosts. They're ruling the roost and that's why the infection rates or ticks are so high and, and the exposure risk um, is, is high as well for people. All right, so we look at our program in a, in a three-phase plan, uh, protect yourself, protect your yard, and protect your pet. Um, the way my job description should have been written 
is to take business away from doctors and hospitals by whatever means necessary, okay? So I'm in the family protection racket and, and your families in Worcester County need protection as well. So here's an average family in Worcester County, all right? This is obviously Millbury, if you've ever been there, and they certainly need protection from tick-borne diseases uh, and from each other. All right, boilerplate recommendations. Long pants when you're out in tick habitat, uh, tucked into your socks. Um, I see pre uh, it keeps the ticks on the outside of your clothing. And in the 10 years I've been working the Cape, I see people making lots of bold, bold fashion statements, but they're not making this one, but it's certainly effective. Um, wearing light colors. That makes sense, makes it easier to see the ticks. I tell people when you come in from an outdoor activity, throw your clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes. That's all it takes to kill any ticks that are on your clothing. You see other extension recommendations, put your clothes in a hot wash cycle and then put them in the dryer forever. Well, research has actually shown that ticks can go through a wash cycle and come out surviving. The only thing that happens to them is they come out nice and shiny before you put them in the dryer and kill them. And shoes, all right? Uh, yeah, flip-flops out in tick habitat, just a bad idea, but I see that all the time on Cape Cod. And when I see that, sometimes I pull people to the side and give them the, the dad talk, as it were. All right, in the event that you are bitten, uh, proper removal. And uh, there's a lot of uh, myths out there and with social media, bad information spreads fast and far. And so I'm always correcting that. Um, so in the event of a tick bite, uh, pointy tweezers, that's really what you need. Um, so it's, it's not the Vaseline the dish detergent or the flaming match trick. I don't know who invented that. And there's something floating around out there that if you use big fat tweezers and crush the tick, you're gonna mainline things like Lyme directly into you. Um, ticks are not syringes. Tick plumbing does not work like that. If you crush that tick, you just might get an infection at the point of attachment. So with pointy tweezers, you just grab that tick by the head as close to your skin as you can get and just gently pull straight up and it will pop, okay? In the event when people see something left behind, all right, that's 911 call Larry. And I've had people sobbing, telling me the head's embedded in them and do they have to go to the ER and get it dug out? And, and I tell people ticks physically can't get their heads into you. Um, what, what they're, what's left behind is that beak of a mouth part, okay, that we looked at earlier with the barbs. That's no worse than a wood splinter, okay? It doesn't transmit disease. So you just hit it with a little neosporin and it's gonna dissolve in a couple of days. I tell people record the date. And it's, I think it's important to timeline these things when, if you know when you've gotten bit because the symptoms of Lyme disease can show up in three days, a week, a couple weeks, a month. Um, so if you record the date and now you're not feeling so good and it's time to have a talk with your primary, you have a reference point to start that conversation. I tell people save the tick, okay? Um, the reason for that, that's evidence, okay? That's case evidence. Like with our research ticks, you can send that to um, the Laboratory of Medical Zoology at UMass Amherst, um, tick list testing lab, uh, tickreport.com, online submission service. Um, once they receive that tick, um, you're gonna get your tick report in three business days or less. And unlike the human blood tests for Lyme disease, this test is 99.9% .9 accurate, okay? So it shows you what you were potentially exposed to. It's a great program. Um, I've personally sent about 4,000 ticks to them in, in 10 years I've been working. So they have an online searchable database. Every tick test they do, 
um, you plug in a zip code, it's going to pull up the tick reports for that neighborhood. So I wanted to show you a couple that I thought were kind of interesting. Uh, this tick report uh, is from a three-year-old boy in Norwell, and he had a tick attached to his head. And they send you back pictures of the tick in an estimate of feeding state. This tick was fully engorged, meaning it was on that kid's head for five days. Obviously, he didn't have a hairdo like me. Um, so that is plenty of, of time for transmission of any pathogen. Um, so we have a 24-hour rule of thumb. If a tick is attached to you for less than 24 hours, the risk of transmission is low. It's not zero, but it's low. And after 24 hours, and certainly 48 hours, risk of transmission ramps up considerably. The exception here is Powassan virus. The transmission time of Powassan has been established at 15 minutes. So as soon as that tick bites you. So this tick tested positive for a couple different things. Um, up top, it was positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the agent that causes Lyme disease. So without medical intervention, that little boy certainly would have came down with Lyme disease. But that tick was co-infected. And this is something we're seeing about 10% of the time. Ticks are carrying more than one pathogen and you can get more than one of these diseases at the same time. And we're trying to drill this into the heads of the medical community on the Cape uh, to let them know this, this is a more than meets the eye situation. Um, but we know babesiosis is not common in, in young people, but it can occur. So, so for the patient, these are hard data. You can go to a doc, your doctor and say, hey, I was potentially exposed to this and I was potentially exposed to this. For a doctor that's on top of their game, they can look at this information and then try and look at you and figure out what's the clinical presentation I should be looking for in my patient to determine the best course of action. Um, here's one, this is a woman in East Ham on Cape Cod and her tick hit the lottery. It was positive for every single thing of interest. Um, and this tick was partially fed. And we don't know the patient outcomes of these uh, reports, but this is certainly uh, very significant. All right, I talk to people about repellents as a first line defense and repellents come in a couple different flavors. So this group up top, uh, DEET or the DEET alternatives like the keratin or oil of lemon eucalyptus, these products are for treating exposed skin. So what it means is that tick won't bite you where that repellent is, but it just might keep walking around until it finds a place where there's no repellent. And then we get this group on the bottom here, the all natural products. And unfortunately, these resonate quite nicely with, with um, soccer moms and soccer dads, okay? Uh, people are thinking I'm using safe something safe and effective on my kids and nothing could be further from the truth. You're dodging bullets with their lives. The difference between these two groups is the group up top, those are EPA registered products. If the label says it repels ticks for six hours, there are data on file at EPA to support that claim. The all naturals, their EPA registration exempt meaning they don't have to supply a shred of evidence that they work at all. And as long as they're not making any outlandish claims on the label, these things slide right through. So I'm hoping at some point, the Federal Trade Commission will swoop in and take these fraudulent products off the shelf, like they've done with fraudulent mosquito and fraudulent bed bug products. So uh, these products gotta go. There's another repellent that contains an active ingredient, permethrin, okay? And this is for treating clothing. So, you know, pants, this is a picture from my sock drawer. I like to have superhero day on some days in the office uh, and footwear. And when I started doing research with this product, what I found is 
if a tick is in contact with a permethrin treated surface for 60 seconds, that tick is guaranteed to die, okay? Uh, it might take five minutes, might take 10 minutes, a little bit longer, but the outcome is guaranteed. And so the biggest problem we had on the Cape is finding the product. So I met with the owners or managers of all the major garden centers on the Cape, and I convinced them to stock these products. And what I'm hearing from them is that it's flying off the shelf. They're uh, during the summer months, they're out of stock more than in stock. So uh, we have, this is the most effective tool in the box. And it keeps its activity through six washings or 45 days because permethrin is really not that water soluble. And treating footwear is absolutely critical. Um, those nymph stage ticks that cause 85% of our problems during the summer months, they're down in the leaf litter. The first place they attach to are your shoes. So I tell people treat your footwear about every four weeks. So uh, put it in your um, iPhone as a reoccurring appointment every four weeks. So it pops up, time to treat the shoes and you're good to go. Now there are different formulations. Uh, this is a water-based pump spray by Sawyer. Uh, there's a number of aerosol-based products. It doesn't matter which one you buy. They're all identical. They, they all contain one half of 1% permethrin. So one is not better than the other. All right, you can also buy uh, pre-treated clothing. Uh, Insect Shield invented this technology a number of years ago. And so you can buy clothing directly from Insect Shield, um, but they also market it through other brands like Orvis and Bean and Ex Officio. And in the upper right, um, that's No Fly Zone. That's a company that popped up in Maine, I'd say five years ago. Uh, similar technology, same bottom line, effective through 70 washings or 10 years, basically the life of the garment. And the third way you can accomplish this, you can take your favorite gardening or hiking clothes and send them to Insect Shield. And for a nominal fee, like 10 bucks a garment, they'll treat them and send them back to you in a couple of weeks with that 70 washings claim. So there's, you can do this three different ways, but I, I recommend uh, permethrin treated clothing uh, for outdoors uh, year round. All right, the elephant in the room, because when I give this talk at, um, say, library programs, and I've got parents in the audience, they look at me like I am absolutely insane, okay? Um, and if you ask my wife, she'd, she'd substantiate that to a certain degree. Um, but they, they tell me, Larry, you're telling me to put my kids in clothing treated with a synthetic chemical pesticide. And I nod my head. I say, absolutely, yes. Remember that slide some time ago? Kids under the age of 10 have the highest incidence rate of Lyme disease in the state. It's time to rethink our game plan. So I spend as much time, uh, this is a psychological barrier. This is not a tox issue at all. But I spend as much time as necessary to walk people through uh, what this chemical is all about. Um, it's not the chemical that makes the poison, the molecule, it's the dose that makes the poison. How much you were exposed to and what was the route of exposure? Was it dermal, oral, inhalation? And in terms of mammalian toxicity, uh, permethrin and chemicals like it, low mammalian toxicity. Uh, kitty cats are the exception. Their little livers can't detoxify this. But if you do the arithmetic on toxicity, it's over 2,000 times more toxic to a tick than a person. People are big, ticks are little, doesn't take much to knock them off. EPA has a position on this now. Um, reasonable certainty, because they can't say absolute, but that permethrin-treated clothing poses no harm to infants, children, pregnant women, and then they later extended that to nursing mothers. And there's uh, criteria certainly would be conservative. And the reason for this is that 
pyrethroids like permethrin have very, very low dermal absorption and whatever small amounts absorbed uh, is metabolized in a couple hours. Um, National Research Council, they, they raised a question about long-term exposure because permethrin-treated clothing was originally developed for the military. And they said, we're gonna have people in this clothing for long periods of time. What are the implications? In their study, they had people wearing permethrin-treated clothing head to toe 18 hours a day every single day for 10 years. And when they rolled up that aggregate exposure, they saw no reason to expect an adverse effect. And the final thing I tell people, this is the active ingredient. You would slather on an infant for scabies mite at a much higher concentration. And it's the active ingredient for treating head lice, which is making a comeback in our school system. So the way I look at this is that when I look at what I think is a very, very low exposure risk cup, and I weigh that against the consequences of any of these tick-borne diseases, for me, that is easy, easy math. Tick habitat. Um, yeah, this is, I pulled this off CDC, and it's a little misleading. It implies that, yeah, you have to go to a, a state forest to get a tick bite. And yeah, state of the senator trail, and if you wander in the vegetation, yeah, you might be running into ticks. Same with open tall grass fields. Yeah, ticks everywhere. Well, your backyard, pretty good exposure risk there. Um, in Connecticut, um, the Connecticut Ag Research Station uh, found that two thirds of the people that were submitting ticks to them for identification and testing got them from their own backyard. So you don't have to go very far. You're, you have tick habitat everywhere uh, as soon as you come out your front door. And deer ticks, you're not gonna find them out in the middle of an open lawn, um, short grass, direct sunlight, high temperature, low humidity. Deer ticks can't survive there. Uh, Lone Star ticks we're finding can venture into that type of environment. But you get to the edge of the yard that might be in partial shade and the transitions into brush and leaf litter and trees. Yeah, you're gonna find ticks there for sure. But if you think about your woody ornamental plantings next to your house uh, and, and walkway, yeah, you can find ticks there as well. So as, as a one-two punch, um, I'm an advocate of perimeter yard spraying, okay? And uh, we have recommendations of um, spraying the perimeter of the yard um, mid to late May, mid to late June, and mid-October. These, these timings are on our website uh, if you're interested. And you can, you can have professional companies do this for you. Um, or you can go to a garden center, get a hose end sprayer and do it yourself and save a lot of money. In terms of the products, um, the, the most effective product that I recommend is that top one, Telstar, uh, the active ingredients by Fenthrin, which is kind of like permethrin. But on contact, this is research from University of Rhode Island. Uh, yeah, 100% knockdown on contact and then 100% uh, uh, control three weeks later. So it's, it's a very good product. There's a number of botanical based products out there, essential oils, so rosemary and spearmint and cedar oil. The, you might as well be spraying water for the, for the benefit you're gonna derive. Now the bottom one uh, looks kind of interesting, uh, MET52. That's a parasitic fungus. So basically a biological control agent. So it's got modest uh, levels of control. So I think with more research on um, application rate and timing, uh, this product could, could be of um, great benefit uh, at some point in uh, future time. Here's a product that's been on the market for some time, uh, Daminex tick tubes, okay? And these are cardboard tubes that contain cotton balls that are treated with permethrin. 
And the idea is that mice will steal those cotton balls, take them down to their burrows and line their nest, and, and they self-treat. And so it's a pretty cool concept uh, if it works. Uh, there were two really good studies done on this, um, multi-year replicated trials, top shelf science. And, and I read the papers and I spoke with both scientists and they each found that these tick twos had no impact on tick populations at all. And they came up with identical reasons. They said that mice aren't compelled to steal cotton balls just because they're there. And not all tick carrying animals steal cotton balls. So um, raccoons don't, squirrels don't, birds don't. Um, so unless your yard is inhabited by mice that have an obsession for cotton balls, there's no reason to expect this product to work. Needless to say, this company took me off their holiday greeting card list. And pet protection. Yeah, this is my odd G slide. Um, there's a number of over-the-counter products that are effective. Um, I tell people, uh, you really should talk to your veterinarian first, uh, the, based on the age of the pet, uh, if they're pregnant, if they're nursing, that might suggest that, you know, some products are, are better bets than others. But certainly tick checks for animals that are coming in from outdoors. Um, the category has been ruled for many years by these um, monthly topical products like Frontline and K9 Advantix 2. And some people find that, you know, monthly uh, kind of gets old after a while. But in recent years, um, in the lower left, there, there's a new product on the market, a Ceresto collar. You put that on your animal, you get eight months of continuous flea and tick control. And I have opportunities to talk to lots of dog owners and a number of them have told me they have swapped out to this collar and they are perfectly happy. And Insect Shield, they were not to be denied a marketing opportunity. They launched the line of permethrin treated neck gaiters and, and vests. And uh, so pretty, pretty cool. I have a colleague, she walks her dog every night in Nickerson State Park in Brewster, which is a uh, tick nirvana, uh, lots of ticks in there. And, and her dog was always picking up ticks. So I gave her one of these vests and, and told her to check it out. And, and she said, the dog is tick free. This thing works like a charm. And I received the grant from Cape Cod Healthcare. Um, I spent six months in a television studio scripting and producing 10 YouTube videos on every topic that you can think of. I've got one on permethrin treated clothing, skin repellents, Lone Star, a demonstration of how to do a perimeter yard spray. So it's all there. So capecodextension.org forward slash ticks, it'll pull up a playlist. So, so you get 90 minutes of the Larry show in, in small buckets. So make some popcorn, pop a cold one or two and, and, uh, and, and, and learn. They, they came out better than I had hoped. So what we've done is really simplify the game plan compared to other extension programs. A lot of other programs give you a list of eight to 10 things to do. But a lot of those recommendations aren't supported by any research. So our program is evidence-based science, okay? So if I can't find data or research to support something, it's not on the list. So, so we have three things, uh, tick checks and use of permethrin treated clothing and footwear. You do this alone, you've reduced your chances of getting a tick bite by 90% fold in a perimeter yard spray, further reduces exposure risk, and pet protection, one, two, three. So while these tick-borne diseases can be um, life-altering or life-threatening, the silver lining is um, they're preventable, okay? We have the tools, um, they're there, we just need to educate people and use them. So if you learned something here tonight, um, tell your family, tell your friends, th these are messages that need to be socialized. 
And so with that, His Holiness and I will entertain any questions that you may have. Great, thank you so much, Larry. What an interesting presentation with lots of good information. Uh, we do have a few questions that have been coming in, quite a few actually. Um, so I just wanna let everybody know before we start answering the questions and before I forget to tell you that this um, presentation has been recorded and I will post it on my, my website, seedstoplate.com, uh, probably in about two or three days. And I will also be sending an email out to all of you who registered for the program with the link in it to this program. So you can uh, share it with others. As Larry mentioned, please spread the word. You can watch it again yourself. Uh, I will include the Cape Cod extension that Larry just gave you so you can check out his other videos. And I will also include some information on affiliate links that I have for that insect shield that he was talking about. Um, I just talked to them today and they were very nice and offered to give us some discounts if yeah. anybody's interested in checking out their website and their selection. As Larry mentioned, you can send your favorite clothes, your favorite gardening clothes to them and they will treat them for you or they have clothes that you can purchase or they have sprays and other, um, I'll put all that information in the email so you can follow up with it. Um, it will also be on my website at seedstoplate.com. So um, I hope that most of you will follow up and, and start getting uh, you know tick protection for yourselves, your friends, your family, and make sure that everybody is protected. So with that, let's go to some questions here. Um, the first one was the, one of my questions, actually the first one was, do you think that tick bite data is gonna change uh, now that people have been outside more because of COVID? I've noticed a lot more people being out in the conservation lands and especially that 20 to 40 crowd that didn't have many um, ticks, tick bites in your data. That, that's absolutely true. Um, people uh, trying to avoid cabin fever are going out and doing things at times of the year they normally wouldn't be out there. And they're, they're kind of surprised that, Larry, it's January and there are deer ticks out there. And I said, yeah, you're right, you're right. So, so I noticed that my call volume during the cold months um, was much higher than previous years. So it is pandemic related. Great. Yeah, I figured that's going to happen. Um, you had mentioned tumble drying your clothes when you get back from a hike, which I sounds like an easy thing to do. Um, do you need to put on a certain temperature to make that work? Uh, high temperature. High, okay. Easy. Okay. Um, and then another one, when you, you talked about sending in ticks, so if you get a tick bite, send it into UMass Amherst um, to their tick research group. How long can you have that tick and still have it present any diseases that it might be carrying? I mean, if it's sitting around for a week or a month or a year, will it still test positive? That tick can be dead for roughly a thousand years. Uh, D DNA is quite stable, so so uh, they they can extract it. the The thing I tell people and and what people are inclined to do is tape that tick to like a piece of paper or an index card. And I tell people, you don't want to do that. Uh, that just slows the lab down. They have to put on solvent, dissolve the adhesive to remove the tick. So just put it in a little snack size Ziploc baggie and close it up and send it on in. Great. Okay. Somebody asked about uh, whether permethrin will work on mosquitoes. Yes, absolutely. Will it kill them or just repel them? Both. Okay, great. Sounds like a good double bonus there. Um, another question is, do nymphs attach the same as the adults? And is the re removal process the same? Yeah, the the hardware is essentially the same. The, the way they, you know, cut into you and, and, and attach, uh, it's, it's the same for adults as well as nymphs, as well as the larvae. And so the removal process is the same. Okay, great. Can dogs and cats get Lyme and some of those other diseases you mentioned earlier? Lyme is very common in dogs. Um, 
not so common in cats. In fact, Katie Brown told me it's hard to induce Lyme disease in a cat, even in, under laboratory conditions. But the other animals that are impacted uh, of note are horses, uh, very susceptible to Lyme disease, um, and goats, uh, which is a up and coming popular pest in, in the state. Pest or pet, was that a... Um... <laughs> You said pest. Was that? Um, are, are you a goat fan or no? I think they're cool. I don't own goats, but I think they're really uh, just watching videos of them online. The way they jump around and climb everything in sight. I think they're and and there are people that use them to as their method of removing poison ivy and other in, invasive weeds. Absolutely. Yeah, and they do yoga too. Who knew? Um, somebody would like to know if yard spray, the yard spray you recommended is okay with edible plants. Yeah, actually, it's not registered for use on food crops. So what, what you're doing, those sprays are directed at leaf litter uh, under the bushes, so the understory. So um, you wouldn't be treating edible plants per se. Can the roots take it up though, and you would find it potentially in the fruit later? No, it's not systemic. Oh, it's not systemic. Okay, good. That would help. One of the one of the attributes of something like permethrin that makes it ideal for our application is that when it hits organic matter or soil particles, it's immobilized. So it's not going to wash off sites, not going to leach into the groundwater. In fact, it's going to penetrate about a half inch into the soil, and it's broken down by soil microbes in about three to four weeks. Great. Does the yard spray kill any other beneficial insects like bees? Uh, you don't see bees foraging in leaf litter, okay? But there are things in leaf litter like springtails. They're part of Mother Nature's recycling committee. So you would see some short-term knockdown of things like those. But uh, springtails, they, they repopulate areas very, very quickly. So there's no um, uh, Rachel Carson scorched earth, silent spring aspect of this. Great. Okay. Good question. Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, we all want to protect the pollinators. Um, what is the best repellent that isn't horrible smelling? I guess that would be kind of a personal preference thing. <laughs> Fine, horrible smelling. I mean, if, if you want a skin repellent, um, uh, oil of lemon eucalyptus would seem to make sense. Okay. Does the permethrin have a strong odor? No, it's odorless. Odorless, okay. So that would be a good option as well. When you treat clothing, you'll smell something initially and that's just the solvent. And so that'll flash off fairly quickly and the permethrin itself is odorless. Okay, great. So um, someone else would like to know if the permethrin expires. Does it have a shelf life? Um, I used to work in consumer products. I used to work for Black Flag. Uh, so I know how to make aerosol based products. And we would plan on a shelf life of about three years. Eventually those active ingredients um, will break down uh, more slowly if it's just in a solvent system versus a water-based system. But, but I tell people consumer products like that, yeah, three years. Okay. So uh, let's see, we've got Adri Adriana, who is from Mexico and has never encountered ticks. And so now they're living in Massachusetts in terror, <laughs> which I can understand. Between the ticks and the poison ivy and, and um, the, the triple E, it, it is a scary place to live. Um, so then she also asked about uh, vaccines, which we did talk about a little bit before the presentation. Um, do you want to talk about the vaccine for a minute for those folks who there, there is currently no vaccine. Uh, the Lyme vaccine that was developed, it's available. It, it's, it's registered with FDA, but no pharmaceutical is going to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, 
the the thing about this is that if even if you have a vaccine for Lyme, you you can't vaccinate your way out of like babesiosis and anaplasmosis and relapsing fever and Powassan virus. So prevention is really the primary go-to on this. Yeah. It's I uh, prevention, what they say prevention is worth a pound of cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, someone is asking if permethrin is toxic to cats. It is. It, it is. is. So, so um, yeah, they're little livers. They can't metabolize permethrin. So if you're treating clothing or if you're doing something like a, uh, one of those monthly topicals like canine Advantix 2, which is also permethrin, um, once that spray is dry on the clothing and veterinarians will, will tell you, uh, just keep the cat separated from the dog until it's dried on the dog's neck, then you can let them get back together and let the cat start beating up the dog again. Uh, so a dried residue is not toxic. Okay, so if you were to get one of those clothing articles like you showed on the dog, if, if you were to get one for your cat, that would be safe? Yeah, I wouldn't even bother um, using it on a cat since they seem to be very um, resistant to Lyme disease, period. Okay. Yeah, I have a cat with a, a belly that drags the ground, so she does pick up ticks. <laughs> Unfortunately, mm -hmm. she hasn't gotten Lyme that I'm aware of. Um, someone wants to know if chickens eat ticks. Yeah, that's something that people are always asking about, you know, can I release chickens or there was um, a lot of media attention, Martha Stewart and Christy Brinkley and Eastern Long Island were releasing guinea fowl um, to eat ticks. And uh, my colleague Rick Osfeld, he, he put a graduate student on that problem. And she found that birds like chickens and others, they can see adult stage ticks that are up on vegetation. Adult stage ticks might be on vegetation and a couple feet off the ground. And, and birds can see that stage, but they can't find those nymph stage ticks to save their lives. So birds, birds are really not a control strategy. Uh, for animals that we need more of, uh, we, we need more possums. Uh, a, a possum will eat about 4,000 ticks per week. They just don't tolerate any feeding at all. So the more possums we have, the better. Interesting. Well, next time I see one walking along my road, I'll bring them home with me. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. They're, they're kind of ornery. You gotta... I, bet, I bet they are. <laughs> Let's see, uh, the next question is yard spray. If you get it on pet's feet and they lick their feet, is that an issue? Uh, for something like your pooch, um, no, it's not an issue, but they shouldn't be out um, in the area when, when it's being sprayed. Uh, if you have a, a professional applicator doing this, uh, your pets should be inside until that spray dries. And same thing if you're gonna do it yourself, uh, but you, you, you pooch, it's, it's not going to bother your pooch. Okay. And then there's another related question that says, how safe is Soresto for humans and pets? Are there any cancer risks? Has there been an increase in dog cancer? Um, not to my knowledge. The, the, the tox data I've read about for Soresto looks, looks pretty clean. Uh, so it's, I can't really fully address it uh, since I'm not a toxicologist per se, um, but the products the products been out in the market for about six years, so it's kind of early to see if there's a long term problem like that. Uh, but performance wise, it's it's doing a great job for pet owners. Okay, good. Uh, somebody else is asking if there's any evidence that taking a hot shower immediately after being outside can encourage a tick to not insert itself, for example, in your hair or, or to actually release itself. I guess the hot water would maybe encourage it to release itself. Yeah, there's no research on that and the county doesn't want me doing shower research on subjects. <laughs> that sounds like a good project for you, Larry. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> 
Uh, what what I tell people is that that when you're going to take a shower, uh, really that's just another opportunity for a tick check. A tick check, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, somebody else is asking, is it true that turkeys eat ticks? And I'm assuming that uh, falls falls into your fowl or uh, your bird discussion that you just had. Yeah, and actually turkeys are good hosts for things like Lone Star Tick. In fact, when they were first describing the Lone Star Tick, they almost named it the Turkey Tick because that's preferred. Uh, okay, now here's, here's one, Larry. Someone wants to know if you put your money where your mouth is. They said, do you buy the permethrin spray and spray your clothing yourself? Are there risks of inhaling the spray, especially if you're spraying many articles of clothing or spraying your clothing and shoes regularly? Money where my mouth is. Yeah, I, I've treated clothing. Um, you do it outdoors. So you just take your pants and socks and put them over a porch rail or clothesline, put your shoes on the deck. You spray them till they're visibly wet. Uh, let them dry for an hour or so, and then you're good to go. It's not, said, it's not something you do inside the house. Okay, and you said you have a video demonstrating that too, and your at your your link that you gave us too, right? Okay, I so, do, I do. Great. Well, uh, make sure we share that so that people can check it out. I've never done it myself, but I am definitely going to try it. So I'll have to watch your video to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Pretty easy. That video series has gotten legs. Uh, it's it's made its way all the way to Australia for. Oh. Tick uh, disease advocacy group, uh, so it's it's rocking itself around. That's awesome. Um, one more person asked about the the need to worry about the yard spray with cats. And I I think you kind of sort of answered that, but I'll let you. Yeah, you just keep your animals inside until the those sprays are dry. Okay. So that's all the questions in the chat so far. Oops, wait, well, there's one more. Uh, what roughly is the cost of the spray? It's about $8 a container. Okay. And yeah. that's enough to treat at least a couple pairs of pants and socks. Uh, boy, a lot, of, a lot of questions. I, I feel like I'm back at UMass and defending my master's thesis. Well, you know, it's interesting. Somebody had said that they um, they signed on and they were planning on watching for 10 minutes, but they were enthralled. So congratulations. You you have got some some um, advocates now. They were enthralled and stayed on. So it, it is, I mean, this is so important to all of us because we do spend a lot of time outside and it, it is something that you want to protect yourself. And like I said, I've, I got Lyme disease last summer, never saw a tick never found a tick, didn't know I had one, but I got the bullseye fortunately, and fortunately got it treated pretty quickly. So um, yeah, if you get the bullseye, uh, you're lucky. That bullseye is a clinical definitive, um, uh, but it doesn't show up in about half the cases. Wow, uh, that many. If you get the bullseye, there's no question about it. Doctors can't uh, yank you around, which some of them are inclined to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found it was interesting when um, when I got tested for it. They tested not just for the Lyme, but they also tested for the babiosis. They tested for malaria. Um, there was a whole list. It was probably that same, very similar list that you showed in, in the, the research data. Um, yeah, doing a full panel test is a good idea, uh, yeah. given the fact that these diseases are now distributed across the state. They're on the increase. Um, so, so I think that's a good practice. Yeah, and, and it was also interesting, they had to test it twice. When they, I got a positive for the Lyme, they did a second Lyme test because apparently it's not as accurate. You were saying when you test the tick itself, it's very accurate, but not this Yeah, the, the tick test is 99.9% .9 accurate. The, the human blood test, you can get false positives, you can get false negatives. It's, it's really unreliable. Interesting. And just another reason not to get ticks, tick bites at all. Absolutely. Okay. Now, I feel bad for that poor woman from Mexico who just moved up here. It, it reminds me of, um, we have a, a, a program, AmeriCorps. So we have um, interns from all over the country uh, come to the Cape for uh, about 11 months. And 
I'm one of their first instructors because they, they do work outdoors with conservation groups. And so they're always out and about. And I'm one of their first teachers. And what I do is I go around the room and I say, okay, who are you and where are you from? Because if there's somebody that's coming from an area of the country where Lyme disease is not that prevalent, I need to really get inside their heads fast. Absolutely. Yeah. At least we don't have scorpions and some of the other things that Mexico does. So every, every place has its dangers, right? Somebody, um, somebody asked about, a, is it dangerous for a cat to eat grass that's been treated with permethrin? That's a hard call because it's, it's, um, you don't know how much a cat is going to be exposed to, um, but if you're concentrating that spray on the leaf litter where where it should be, mm -hmm. I think the the cats are okay. Yeah, because they're typically going after the grass. Yeah. yeah, I would just be mindful of of exactly where the spray uh, pattern goes. Okay. All right. Well, in the interest of time, I think we will uh, stop stop the questions there.